continue with our study of First John, and uh, we're still basically within the context of what started in verse 20 of First John chapter 2, where John said to them regarding the knowledge they had to refute false doctrine that he addresses here, but if you but you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. American Standard says uh, anointed. Uh, this again we spent some time on last week regarding the matter of the miraculous gifts that existed in the church in the apostles through the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit and then their ability to impart by the laying on of hands a gift to different members of the church I think sometimes and I'll add this to this, but I may have said it last week. Um, I think sometimes we fail to realize that those people in talking about the working of the Holy Spirit in their day and time would have had in mind the miraculous powers of the apostles and the particular miraculous gifts existing in the church through the imposition of the apostles' hands in lieu of the fully revealed and completed New Testament of Christ. At the time John wrote this, he tells them you have the wherewithal to overcome this false doctrine. And starting in about verse 27, you'll see that he continues with the idea of this gift that they have from the Spirit to enable them to refute this false doctrine in particular, but really any false doctrine. Notice, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is true and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall be able or ye shall abide in him. Uh, it should be understood here that when he says, that uh, you uh, know all things. It, it doesn't mean they became omniscient, but you have the things wherewith you can deal with this particular false doctrine and any other one that would come your way. This lets, gives us an insight into the miraculous gifts, though I think it, virtually impossible for us to understand how you would have one and use it but these gifts were subject to the ones that had them paul told him they don't neglect the gift that's in you and here you can see that he is telling them use it well i don't know how miraculous gift was the actual thought in my mind or feeling or whatever you want to call it of what it would be like to be able to draw upon a miracle say like the gift of tongues uh, here's a person that only speaks um, Mandarin Chinese and I can just immediately will to speak Mandarin Chinese and speak it fluently I don't understand that but evidently they could even they could be abused and that's what we said last week concerning the situation as it was in the church in the city of Corinth in Greece that they had misused and abused the miraculous gifts and thus an apostle of Christ, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing part of what would be the New Testament, writes the church in Corinth and corrects them concerning the very gifts that came through the imposition of the apostle's hand. So God has never overruled our free moral agency. Whatever he does, he allows for that uh, for example let's take the apostle peter paul tells us in the galatian epistle that peter was wrong because he played the hypocrite he ate with gentile christians in the church in antioch of syria until certain jews came from jerusalem down there and he withdrew himself well, he taught no false doctrine, either in writing or orally. But his example was 
teaching error. He was, by example, saying that Jews who are Christians won't give full fellowship to Gentiles who are Christians. And Paul took care of that matter. But notice the way some people think of miracles, especially the apostles, having been baptized with the miraculous powers of Holy Spirit, that they didn't have to worry about making mistakes. Well, Peter should have drawn from something that would have stopped him from that. After all, look what he taught in Acts 10 and 11, and even uh, in Acts 2, verse 39, though he didn't grasp fully all of that, and evidently out of weakness in Antioch of Syria, he failed there. Well, the miraculous gifts then wouldn't, whether you're an apostle or one who received a certain gift through the laying on the apostle's hands, it wouldn't mean that you didn't have control and that you couldn't abuse it, that you couldn't neglect it, thus not benefiting from it. So he reminds them in this letter, inspired of the Holy Spirit, who gave them this anointing, that you have the wherewithal to deal with this false doctrine, if you will but use it. And notice how he connects this anointing in the middle of verse 27 with truth. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, again, all things necessary to dealing with what I'm writing to you about, and is true. And is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, which would be the truth, you shall abide in him. Well, again, that shows us that they had to exercise this anointing, as the King James says, unction that it would lead them to what is true and would expose, therefore, what is a lie. And they would have the wherewithal to see through this false doctrine that John is talking about. And, of course, it would be, in this case, early Gnosticism. So then the emphasis is given to what he's done ever since he started the letter in verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. I think if you take verse 29, you have the faithful child of God motto, if there is such a thing, to be righteous even as Christ is righteous. And we've defined righteousness many times from Psalm 119, verse 172, that all of our commandments are righteousness. So he speaks of those commandments pertinent to Christianity, that is, that which is manifested by Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth. When Christ was speaking of the Holy Spirit coming to the apostles following his resurrection and ascension to heaven, the rule at the right hand of God, as Peter declared him doing in Acts 2, uh, you'll remember that he, that is the Christ, taught the apostles that when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So when you look at the Holy Spirit's work, he is pictured as the revealer and the confirmer of truth. So anybody that takes a position contrary to the teaching of the New Testament is in opposition to the Holy Spirit. Because his job was to reveal the mind of Christ. Remember Christ said, I'll pray the Father and he'll send you another comforter, another parakletos, which means uh, one who will be what I was with you. He'll be invisible because he will not be incarnate as I am at the time Jesus said those things to the apostles. So they can take me as a human being and get rid of me, but you'll have him with you always as I have been with you, another comforter, implies a first one. So he now, John, who as an apostle, received the baptismal measure of the Spirit. He had that kind of working of the Spirit with him that Jesus described and John wrote down himself in the Gospel of John in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. So now we see then that the early church, without the completed written down New Testament, had the wherewithal by the proper use of miraculous gifts to deal with these things. 
and they were expected to use what they had. And therefore, their attitude had to be right. Or they might end up like the uh, Corinthians and misuse and abuse those gifts and be in a worse situation than before. So with that in mind, we move now into chapter 3, which again, let me say there are no chapters or verses in the original letter. So he moves right in and he says, Behold, here's something to see. Um, holding up a new chart for you to look at, get your attention. And what is it I want you to behold, to see? What is the spotlight on? What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us? Well, how do we see what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us? That we shall be called the sons of God. The American standard says children of God. Therefore, remember therefore and hence and wherefore and such. That means I've given you the facts. I'm reasoning with them. Here's the conclusion. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Again, reminding them that if you serve Christ faithfully and you are like Christ because you do, therefore you're righteous even as he is righteous, then the world's going to treat you just like a treated Christ. I think over all the years of preaching that one of the things that seems to be neglected uh, almost as a surprise to a lot of people who are members of the church is that they're treated badly because they're members of the church or because they stand up for what is right, whatever that right is at the time, and the need to stand for it. And they seem to be almost surprised that the world does anything about them. But we've been vaccinated against that all the way through the New Testament from the teaching of our Lord while he was on earth all the way through what we've seen in all the letters that make up the New Testament. And we shouldn't be surprised. So he's emphasizing here that we shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. Then he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, the children of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Okay. Well, we know that we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, in the resurrection. We know from First Corinthians 15 that the resurrected body is fitted for the eternal abodes of heaven for the saved, even as this body is created by God to live in this world. And yet it is a glorious body to read how Paul describes it. So we can know some things, but as far as being able to grasp the details and the particulars of it, uh, we don't. Uh, and notice, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Well, that's said to those who are faithful Christians. This doesn't address those who are unfaithful and who die cut off from God or those who never obey the gospel. Uh, in the message of the evening delivered by Eric, then he addressed the fact of the Lord visiting vengeance, and it would be eternal vengeance upon those who are not in service to God faithfully at the end of the world when the Lord returns. But this is giving hope to the one that is faithful, that you first of all have the wherewithal to expose every false doctrine and know the truth. And next of all, you're able to you'll be able to see him as he is because that's the way you're going to be. And whatever in our minds uh, comes up regarding the glorified Christ, then you're going to be that way. And he just simply says you're going to see him as he is. And so whatever the glorified body of Christ is like, then you're going to be like that. And that, of course, is all designed to give one strength and to give one encouragement. I find it rather interesting that though it be in symbolic uh, figurative speech, that we do have a picture of Christ given by John himself as Christ revealed himself to him at the beginning of the book of Revelation. And uh, when you see what I can only describe as a glorified Christ, uh, he's, he's given in an, an amazing way you turn over to Revelation chapter 1, 
when John sees him in the midst of the candlesticks in verse 13, notice how he's described. One like in the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about with packs with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like into fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And when he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth with a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Look at the impact this had on John. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Well, I recognize that this symbolic or figurative picture of the Christ was primarily for the message he was going to deliver to the churches. So I'm not saying that we can look at that and see it at the actual glorified Christ when he's coming. John already said, you don't, we don't know that, not been revealed to it. But it does give us an idea of the magnificent power and radiance and how bright and amazing and dazzling and any other descriptive terms you want to use when it comes to the glory of Christ when he comes again. So why is that here? Because, as I said a couple of times already, it's designed to encourage Christians to bear up under persecution, to be ready to meet all false teachers in or out of the church, and to know that we are laboring for a reward that will elevate our present physical body of corruption to a body in the resurrection that is glorified. And you get a little bit of a picture of that, but glorified even if you don't, to what extent, as Christ now has. And that's the point that he makes in verse 2. Then notice what we should do because we know these things. And he says what I said earlier, really, and every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as pure. When you see the sinless glory, majesty, honor, and power of Christ in his resurrected body, glorified body and that john says by the spirit that we shall be like him what impact should that have on the faithful child of god it should make him even more concerned that he will think and speak and act as the new testament teaches christians are to do that it can honestly and truly wear the name christian which means of christ as he uh, does with pureness of heart and that he will be what God through Christ of the gospel teaches him to be and makes him to be. So every man that hath this hope, this expectation of heaven, has this earnest desire to possess the expectation that he's going to walk closer to the Lord. He's going to be more faithful. He'll be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as he knows his labor is not in vain in the Lord. Verse 15, 15, 58. And that ties in so wonderfully well here with verse 3. And every man that hath his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Then immediately after this, and think about what he's already written from the beginning of the, of the letter. Whosoever, and that's as broad as the human race, whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law for sin is the transgression of the law the american standard says uh, lawlessness in the place of transgresses he's a lawless person you mark down anybody that is a wicked person he's a lawless person he's living according to how he wants to live and that is without law when you look at our nation today multitudes of people multitudes of people are transgressors or they're lawless they're without law they don't appreciate law they don't respect law authority to them is the enemy to them and anybody in the position of authority becomes an enemy to them and not to be obeyed that's where we are and 
when you have people who have no appreciation at all for an objective standard of right and wrong, then that's the way they're going to be. Because the truth of the matter is, here's what they want. Give us the power, and we'll be what we want to be, and we'll make you be what we want you to be. And that's always been a problem. In the founding of these United States, the fathers tried to come up with a system of government that would be able to head all that off. And thus, we have the three areas of the federal government, and even the governments in the states and the counties and so forth are designed uh, with checks and balances. That doesn't get said a lot about nowadays. They're checks and balances. And thus, there's three areas to our government. And yet you see that everything is being done by so many to ignore an absolute objective standard of, of right and wrong, whether it be laws or the Constitution, from which our laws are to be derived, and I speak on the federal level. And thus, what do you expect these people to think of God? What do you expect them to think of God's word, the Bible? Uh, so no wonder then many in recent years have said, well, the Bible is not a rule book. The Bible is not a law book. It's just simply a narrative. And I've never appreciated what that means. But that's what they call it to try to say it's not a law book. It's simply a narrative that tells you about the love of God for lost mankind. And if you recognize your lost condition, you can't save yourself. No other humans can. And you look to the love of God that the Bible tells you about. And you ask God through or ask Christ to come into your heart to save you. Everything's all right after that. Well, that simply still allows you to do the please. And that's what the devil always has op uh, operated to accomplish in the mind of those he deceived. Started out with Mother Eve in the garden, and it continues to the present, and it will go on to the end of time, whether that's today or tomorrow, a thousand years from now, whenever. So he says plainly then, whosoever commits sin transgresseth also the law, or sins and transgresseth the law. Now, that also says if there is no law in the Christian system, in the Christian dispensation, but it's all grace, how do people sin? There must be a law for people to sin. And this same Bible says that all have sinned. Well, they couldn't sin if there wasn't a law because sin is a transgression of the law. So people sin by transgressing the will of Christ. It's he has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. And uh, we need to understand that part to refute certain doctrines that arise at our time that says there's no law. Just do as you please and feel good about it. And don't get into arguments with other people about what's right and wrong. That's the reason I've said many times lately and for a number of years now that, that the concern for doctrine, for the teaching of Christ by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25, has fallen on hard times. You could not have the division uh, and the apostasy that it has existed in the church for many years now, and thus a fragmentation to where you don't know, unless you have a way to know, what a congregation believes, how concerned they are about what they believe. Unless you have an inside track on some congregations, you don't know where they stand. You don't know what they're doing. And one of the big things in this area that has really hurt, and I've watched it develop since I was a young man, and that is if a person is teaching the truth on whatever subject it might be, he can pretty much fellowship anybody he wants to, and, and you don't ever really have a problem with that. I've had a number of cases over the years to where I've pointed out certain things, and others have too, about a certain teacher, and they'll say, well, what did he teach us wrong? Well, I, I want to ask them, what did Peter teach was wrong? Because Paul was standing in the face saying that Peter was to be blamed. He didn't teach anything by word of mouth or by epistle that was sinful. But his actions were sinful because he was withdrawing fellowship from people who were in fellowship with God. And that was, that was his own brethren there in Syria, the church of Antioch, 
who were Gentile Christians. Peter simply withdrew fellowship from people who were in fellowship with God. Well, John is saying here, I want you to be in fellowship with God, even as we apostles are in fellowship with God, that your joy may be full. I don't have a right to extend fellowship that is taught the scriptures to people who are not in fellowship with God. And I don't have, let's say, not right, but authority from God to withhold fellowship from anybody that's in fellowship with God. What I have authority to do is, number one, make sure I'm in fellowship with God. And number two, make sure I fellowship only those who are in fellowship with God. Somebody comes up and says, well, well, what? How do you know what's on in the minds of men? Well, I'm quite sure the day I die, whether that's today or some years in the future, I'll die in fellowship with some people that are out of fellowship with God. Why is that the case? Not hard to figure out. I'm a human being and I'm finite. I can't know everything in the mind of everybody. But I'm to act upon what I know. Now, let me emphasize that again. I am and you are to act upon what you know. And that's all John's saying here. John's saying, take the truth you have, you received it from the Holy Spirit, and apply it to whatever doctrine comes your way. And you're going to see that brought out further as we go through here. In verse 5, and you know that he was manifested, speaking of Christ, to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Now notice this. Where is there no sin? In him. There is no sin. Well, that takes us back to 1 John 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Those who are faithful in Christ continually are, are, are continually covered by the blood of Christ, which blood they contacted when they were baptized into his death. What was in his death that shed his blood. And thus it's applied to us, and our sins are continually washed away. And in him there is no sin. Then notice again, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Well, that's just saying whosoever is faithful to him can't be sinning because he's faithful. It doesn't mean you don't from time to time through human weakness and ignorance commit sin, but your life's not lived in sin. You're not a sinner as the Bible describes a sinner. Sinner is one who is separated from God. Sinner is one who practices lawlessness, who is not walking in the light as Christ is in the light. And yes, we all make mistakes, and John warns us about that in the same uh, first chapter. Notice again, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So again, we're laboring, as Paul said to the Philippians, to forget those things are, are behind, good or bad. Forget about them. They're over and done with. And then you look to the future. You press on to be right with God however long you are to live on this earth. So, little children, there's those terms of endearment again. Let no man deceive you. There's the point of the whole thing. Notice the let. Let me emphasize that again. That's a command of God. To me and to you and to every member of the church, you have an obligation to yourself not to believe a lie and follow after it. And you have the wherewithal so that you won't be if you will take the time to do it. Notice as the verse continues, verse 7, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. That's no uh, surprising thing. Uh, righteousness all of God's commandments are righteousness. If you're a righteous person, you're keeping the commandments of God. And that doesn't seem to be hard to grasp. Well, what's a Christian doing? He's being righteous. How? By continuing steadfastly in doing what the Bible says Christians are to do, whether it's in service or worship or anything else. That's how we assure our hearts that we're acceptable to him any time. Now, you may get up one day feeling terribly bad. Uh, you had a headache and you may be sick at your stomach or whatever. And you may not feel worth anything or you may be depressed and down and out and all that and trouble in the house. And, but that doesn't tell you that you're unrighteous. You're still just as righteous as you ever were. 
because those things are not within themselves things that violate God's will. They just simply are part of being a human being. So he that committed sin is of the devil. Well, is that interesting? If you're righteous, you're of Christ. But if you commit sin, you're the devil. He's talking about going into sin and staying in sin. You'll see that develop more as time goes on. He's not talking about the person who makes a mistake from time to time, who sins from time to time, but then is re rectifying it, doing all they can to be what they ought to be. Notice, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. I wish I knew more about that, but we don't know it. We just know that in that situation, he broke God's law. He sinned. He's the originator of sin. He's the father of sin. Well, for this purpose, or well, what purpose? Because of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that harkens all the way back to the first prediction that the seed of woman would bruise the head of the serpent, Genesis 3.15. So what's he doing by bringing all that up? Reminding them what Jesus said when he says, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Thus he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. So you come back to verse 9. Again, whosoever is born of God, any person accountable to God for his action is born of God, doth not commit sin. What's the meaning? Does it sound like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth? Talks about one place, don't say you don't have any sin. Here he's saying you don't sin. He's talking about the difference in the person who is faithful and a person who gets overtaken and trespassed and doesn't come out of it or just completely leaves the old system of faith. So when you're born of God, you're faithful to God, what happens? You don't commit sin. I think... Um, when we realize the difference in pur purposely and habitually living in sin over and against committing sins of ignorance or weakness of human flesh from time to time, but not routinely and not habitually, not purposely, then we don't get this. There has to be a system that saves us, that allows for the fact that we have to grow and develop and to become more like Christ. The babe in Christ can't be what the mature Christian man is or woman in Christ. Well, then what saves the babe in Christ? And what saves the older person, spiritually speaking? The same blood that washes away sin of the babe in Christ as he toddles along, figuratively speaking, striving to grow and to develop by desiring the sincere miracle of the word that he may grow but thereby. That saves the person who's been 40 years in the church as a mature Christian. It's the same blood that cleanses. It's the same favor of God that takes them all into heaven when they die. So, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And here's the key to the whole thing. For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, let's see. What is that sin? Uh, that seed, excuse me. That seed is the seed of the kingdom. Well, what is the seed of the kingdom? It's the word of God. Luke chapter 8, verse 11. If you have the word of God abiding in you and controlling your life, tell me how you can sin. As long as that's going on, you can. It's the same as saying, well, I'm faithful to the Lord, but I commit sin all the time and I don't do anything about it. It doesn't make any sense. The person who's faithful to the Lord 
the person who has the word of God, the seed of the kingdom remaining in him, is striving with all of his or her might to be obedient to God and to examine themselves to see whether they be in the faith. That's what you do when you're faithful to God. Part of, of realizing you are faithful to God is that you're doing self-checks all the time. You're always checking your thoughts and your actions, what's uh, omitted from your life, and so on. So whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And you cannot sin him because he's born of God. If I'm doing God's will, how can I sin? In that area, whatever the will of God I speak of. Well, you can. So if you don't want to sin, then do what God says. And you won't. Now in this, he says, in this, in this what? What he just said in verse 9. In this, the children of God are manifest. What do you mean? Well, you can tell when a child of God is faithful to God. Jesus taught that by saying, by their fruit you shall know them. If you can know a person's evil by the fruit that he bears, then you can know that a person is faithful to God by the fruit that he bears. It doesn't mean that that person is flawless, but it does mean he's faithful. And there can be a difference. It allows for the growth and development from the baby in Christ and that's why John started out, as we pointed out, concerning uh, uh, the fathers and those who were the young men, talking about their spiritual growth and development, because they're at different stages of growth and development. It'd be ridiculous to look at the congregation of, of 100 people or even 25 people and say they're all the same degree of knowledge and practice of the truth of God. They wouldn't be. They wouldn't be at all. Well, then what preserves them? What keeps them? What makes them remain justified and reconciled to God and to have the hope of heaven? Because they are laboring, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And thus that gives them the knowledge uh, to know where they stand with God. I think it's a good point to ask yourself, where do I stand with God? We ought to ask other people that. Where do you stand with your God? Well, it's going to be either I and not standing with him, or I am standing with him. Well, the one standing with him, he's acceptable to God. He's what he ought to be. He's righteous. So we read in verse 10, and this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Everybody in this world is accountable to God for their actions. It's either a child of the devil or a child of God. There's no in between. No in between at all. So whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Again, showing the attachment that should exist and obtain between brothers and sisters in the family of God, the church. We should be striving to help each other along the way to be right with God. Well, you know, when you think about it, that's all that's important. Just to be right with God. What would what would be more important than for one to be striving to be right with God? I can't think of it. And what would be more important to each one who is striving to be right with God than to help their brethren be right with God? And that's a very important point that John's getting over here to them. Notice in verse um, 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Well, from what beginning? From the beginning of, of your knowledge of the truth that was given to you. You're taught to love one another. Uh, this love is uh, tied in with the agape love and the phileo love, uh, the closeness that involves even emotional attachment is seen in uh, the best friend, sometimes people say, well, this is my best bud, or something like that. Well, they're talking about this very close attachment that brothers and sisters would have, likened even to a physical family, but sometimes even more so in the Lord's family. It's a fellowship. It's a, a desire to see my brothers and sisters remain faithful and go to heaven. So we do whatever the Bible says to help them to do that. So for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we love one another. That love will lead us to get people to see their sins, their mistakes, their shortcomings, and to walk closer to God 
by adhering to the truth. Now notice he gets pretty particular here. He gets very plain. And what he's about to say indicates they knew the Old Testament. For he says, not as, verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, his brother's righteous. Well, again, that harkens back to the fact that people who don't like you pointing out their sins from God's word will tend to attack the bearer of the news of God. Uh, Stephen was the first Christian martyr. Stephen wasn't the one who told them who originated the message that he preached to them. He was the instrument through which Jesus preached them to save their soul. But they became very angry at him, so much so that they put him to death. And again, this would be something that would say, we don't live that way. Um, again, let me draw from uh, Paul and Peter's situation at Antioch of Syria. You never find anything in scriptures that says that Peter was proud and haughty and was all upset at Paul for the rest of his life because Paul rebuked him before others. And then Peter, remember, was a faithful member of the church and an apostle before Paul was converted. But he didn't look at it that way. And you'll see early on, um, before First John was written, Peter talks about our beloved apostle Paul. Well, I've seen people who got themselves all caught up in error rather than work with them, were patient with them, and were even in the process of withdrawing from them, and maybe sometimes did withdraw fellowship from them because they wouldn't repent. And that was the very thing that caused those people to repent. And later on, they did. And actually then, I know one situation to where they stood before the church and said, there hadn't been these elders leading the church to withdraw from us, we never would have repented. Well, that's the design of it. But if they want it, purges the church of sinful people. So the love here is the kind of love that leads brethren to cause the truth to be taught no matter who or what is uh, there and how whatever they think about it. Because we love one another. We want everybody to be in heaven. And we know the only way to do that is for people to be righteous, even as he is righteous. Well, our time's gone for tonight. And before we go further, and you might mark it, we'll try to start at about verse 12, 13, uh, next time again, the Lord willing. But before we close, let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray. Our Holy Father, we're again thankful we could be together in the midst of this week to study thy word and to meditate on it. May we do so daily. Help us to be honest with ourselves and with the word as we study it, that we might see ourselves as thou dost see us by gazing intently into the perfect law of liberty, that we might see who we really are and that when upon seeing it, that we'll make any kind of adjustments that need to be, that will bring us in harmony with thy will. May we strive to be righteous, even as he is righteous. We pray it in his name. Amen.